Good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm Dr Hannah Greenstreet, lecturer in creative writing here at the University of Liverpool and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Liverpool Literary Festival. Following on from the great success of our previous festivals, we are delighted to welcome more internationally renowned writers to the city. The festival's main sponsors are Student Roost and Bruntwood and we're very grateful for their support. Please wait for our speakers to leave the hall before you do so they can get downstairs to Blackwell's Festival Bookstore. There you can buy their books, which they'll be delighted to sign. We'll also leave time after the talk for audience questions, but please make, wait for microphones so everyone can hear you. This morning, I'm delighted to be introducing Lauren John Joseph. Uh, Lauren John Joseph was born here in Liverpool and lives in London. They write for the page, the stage and the screen. Their film and performance work has been shown internationally across the UK, US, Europe and Asia. They are the author of plays Boy in a Dress and A Generous Lover and the experimental prose volume Everything Must Go. At certain points we touch, their first novel is a story of first love and last rites, conjured against a vivid backdrop of London, San Francisco and New York, a riotous, razor-sharp coming-of-age story that marks the arrival of an extraordinary new talent. So Lauren's got something to read for us to kick us off, really. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm going to read you a five-minute section um, from At Certain Points We Touch, um, <clears throat> which is the protagonist reflecting on their lost lover and their lost lover's interests. And there's a little bit about um, Liverpool in here, too. So, home city represent. You were a photographer. You were a creep. Architecture is what you studied, but photography is what you loved. You paid the same slavish rebel Asian devotion to images of post-war buildings, which are now canonical, but were then only ugly, as you did to pictures of young boys sliding off their underwear. You had a disorganized Xerox collection of both, dog-eared and stacked up, falling to the floor, an upheaval of your twin obsessions, a mess which would have become an archive, I'm sure, had you lived that long, had you become that famous photographer. You took pictures all the time, sneaky snapshots at parties on cheap, compact cameras, blinding people in nightclubs with those incandescent flashes, throwing a shadow up the wall, exposing reddened eyes, capturing revelers' mouth open mid-revelation. Of course, you never asked first. You took pictures of the circles we inhabited and the globe you traveled. You visited Iceland, South America, the coast of China. Yes, you voyaged far and wide in your short life. Meanwhile, I managed to to and fro to California once a year, imagining that I was the one seeing the world. How hindsight embarrasses us. It's almost as if that's her sole function. Not reflection, not contextualization, no. Just a note to let you know in private moments of contemplation, just to say, oh dear, look what an idiot you were then. I've seen some of the places you've photographed firsthand now. Sometimes, especially when passing through the capitals of Latin America, I almost thought I might discover you there, that maybe you'd faked it like a Nazi general and fled to Buenos Aires. It gave me the same uncanny sensation of nauseous comprehension when I recognized a building from one of your pictures as when I first saw the photograph of the falling man plunging from the North Tower of the World Trade Center and remembered that I had been up there myself as a child in the 90s. Everything disparate rushes together in moments like that and makes me feel like there is nothing beneath me anymore, as though I'm hurtling downwards too, like that falling man striking his beautiful pose, like an arrow, like a dancer, his final seconds now forever suspended outside of time. You took pictures with cameras of dubious workability on film of untrustworthy character, even when you were photographing a friend's wedding or some other important moment that didn't seem well suited for pranks. Yes, it was irresponsible. It was selfish, even. And that was motivation enough for you. But more than that, it was an experiment in seeing the world. The pictures might come out in strange ghostly greens or as double exposures, as spectral blurs, or else they might not come out at all, leaving you with only 28 black and shiny canvases of nothingness streaked occasionally with red trails, like an eyeball stricken with uvitis. You photographed strange street scenes, 
tricks and lovers, the jungle, and always those same square, ineluctable buildings, brutalist, Bauhaus, which to my underclass eye could only ever speak of council estates and tower blocks, but which seemed to you, born of Kent's cricket fields, so bold and clean and honest, free of any frivolity, masculine, authoritative. My own tastes have always been Baroque, florid even. I always wanted everything in gold leaf on Louis heels. So I couldn't appreciate those concrete hulks any more than I could salivate over your cachet of slender hairless boys posing nude for unseen, unknown photographers. Your enthusiasm for stark grey buildings was lost on me. I lived in one of those unforgiving slabs of modernity you adored until I was primary school age, until we were burgled by junkies and the council moved us to a new estate near the docks. My grandparents lived in one too, on the 14th floor of a shoddy 1960s tower block. From their living room you could see out over the Mersey and as a child I dreamt of flying from the window to somewhere new. I would stand, resting my chin on the window ledge, hypnotized by the sublime terror of being so far above the little houses below, panic-stricken in case I should somehow be taken by a gust of wind and dropped onto the street, torpid in terror, but comforted by some proto-erotic sensation. I stared for hours out of the window, imagining how long it would take me to hit the ground. I would ask my nan in alarm and delight, what would happen if there was a fire at night? Knowing that we were forbidden to use a lift in case of emergency, I was paralyzed with the holy fear of being trapped up there, with Nanny in her wheelchair and my grandfather, still sprightly in his late fifties, but hardly fit to carry her down a thousand blazing stairs. <coughs> You'd have to go down with your granddad, she said, knitting pragmatically, and send the fire brigade up for me. I couldn't do that, I exclaimed, disgusted at the idea. We couldn't leave you. Well, <coughs> You'd have to, love, she said, and changed the channel in time to shout her answers out at a favorite TV quiz show. Having lived in them, having feared dying in them, I couldn't love those buildings like you did. That aesthetic of social uplift through moral <coughs> discipline was not at all photogenic to me. I think of my nanny often, combing her waist-length gray hair like a jukebox Rapunzel, with her Doris Day records on display, dying of a heart attack, waiting for the ambulance. And I wonder now whose story I'm trying to tell. The way all of this comes together, every previous sorrow paving the way to you, as Anya Zvada put it, the most cherished of the dead. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much, Lauren. I think this gives a great flavor of the book, which is sort of reflecting on a really significant relationship in the protagonist's life. Could you tell us a bit more about what made you want to write it, why you needed to write this book? Mm, yes. Um, I lost a friend um, in a very sudden and tragic manner. And as soon as he died, I thought, that would be a great thing to write about. <laughs> and subsequently followed that thought by thinking, no, that is beyond tacky. Give it a break. You don't have to mine every trauma in your life as artwork. But I did. Um, it took a long time of like exploring the idea, resisting the idea. And eventually I just caved in, actually. It, I felt haunted. I felt like I could not not write this book. Yes, I felt as almost as if I had him on my shoulder, sort of poking me until I agreed to do it. And I resisted for a very long time. And it was only because I took a trip to Mexico City with a one-way ticket and then sort of got stuck in Mexico. It's a familiar experience. I'm so many have found themselves stuck in Mexico <laughs> City. And I had nothing to do and I had no money. So I thought, mm, maybe I'll just see how it feels to write about this. And how would you describe the book? Yes, it's a love story. It's a love triangle between three people and each of the characters in the love story has a very different understanding of what's going on. There's two people who think, well, one person thinks they're in a monogamous relationship, one person thinks that they're just kind of dating, the other one is entirely unsure what they mean to either of the other two participants. Mm. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's a classic love story, I think, yeah. 
And from the passage you read, um, there's a lot of photography in there. Uh, elsewhere in the book, there are lots of kind of quotations from other writers, allusions to other writers, passages about the kind of process of writing. Um, which writers inspire you and why? For this book, I was very much inspired by um, Crudo by Olivia Lang. Probably, you know, um, Olivia Lang's books. Um, she'd written a whole series of books like To the River and um, The Lonely City, which were investigations of, I suppose you might say, thematic or <coughs> social issues, so alcoholism or loneliness in a city. And they were very intimate. Um, and she'd really sort of found a rhythm and become very successful at what she was doing. Some of those books were selling like 100,000 copies. And then she got to Crudo, which is a completely different book. And she sort of threw her process out the window and said, I'm going to write a novel in real time. It won't be edited. It'll be published in the same year. And I just thought it was so bold. I think that book came out in maybe 2018. And it was the first book for a long time that I thought had a real, it was absolutely contemporary. It captured the moment it was written in and the moment I was reading it in. I, often I felt connections to other writers, but writers from 100 years ago. And it was the first time I'd read a writer who was writing now that I had that vivid electrical connection to. So I was so Im impressed by her writing her own, rewriting her own rule book. Um, and, a, and I loved the book as well. Also, I was very much influenced by um, Edmund White's Nocturnes for the King of Naples. Edmund White, White wrote a lot of those classic 70s, I'm gay, I'm coming out books like The Beautiful Room is Empty and A Boy's Own Story. And Nocturne for the King of Naples is a, a, it's written second person and addressed to a lover who's no longer there. So I very much borrowed that sort of elegiac tone and that intimacy from him. But also I think this book owes a lot to um, In Search of Lost Time as well the way that Proust has that constant movement between Proust writing the book, Proust looking back on a character called Marcel, and then a sort of narrative voice on the top, and moving through those three registers, I think. Yeah, it owes something to Proust. Not to like compare myself to the master, but I mean, I guess I just did. So, um, you, so you talked about being haunted by this story. I think reading the book, sometimes it seems like other authors are also haunting the book. Why is it important to have the voices of other authors in there? I think because writers are always writing in reference to other writers. And, you know, you can read through any book. And, you know, you'll constantly, if you're doing a deep read, you'll be going through Jane Austen or whatever and be like, oh, this is a biblical illusion. Here's a bit of Shakespeare. Um, and I just wanted to be very explicit with that actually to say here is the thinking process and also to I hope point out to my readers other readers they might like mm. so where I've been very explicit to say oh this is from Maggie Nelson or Ocean Vong says this then maybe people will read it and be like oh yeah Ocean Vong sounds great I'm sure plenty of people are familiar with Ocean Vong but you know so yeah I wanted to signpost people to other texts but also I I do believe writers are always in conversation on the page and I wanted to be a bit maybe sort of Brechtian with that. I don't know, like sort of show show the framework and the and the tools. Yeah. Um can we talk a bit more about the tone of the novel? So as you said, it's written in the second person and it's a kind of address by JJ to their former lover. Um and you've called it elegiac, but it's also maybe quite a seductive novel. Mm, yes. Yes, I think that comes from the this term, which I borrowed from Edmund White, using the second person direct you. Um, so that makes it intimate and makes it feel very close to the reader, I think. Um, and it also feels very confessional. Mm -hmm. I also think using second person allows the, the you to whom the book is direct, directed is the character Thomas James. But a reader reading the book that you is also conflated with the reader. So that it, although it's directed to a character, when you're reading it, I think it might seem as though it's been spoken to you, um, which is intimate and seductive. And because it's a fairly long novel, it's 300 pages, 
It's 100,000 words. You spend a lot of time with these characters and with this voice. So I think, yeah, you develop a real intimacy. There's a real rapport between the, the reader and the, and the protagonist in this book. And uh, yeah, that's deliberately so. A lot of my work has been influenced by live artists and performance artists like Penny Arcade and Karen Finley, who on stage use this direct address where they talk to the audience the whole time. Um, and it can be very electrifying and really engaging. And so I, I try to maintain something of that, actually. Because they're some of the most important writers to me, I would say, um, were writers for the stage. Because I, I grew up reading everything. Basically, everything my mother read, I read. I didn't really want to be a child. I thought it was a terribly vulgar thing to be. I really wanted to be an, an adult. So, so I, I, read, I read a lot. But it, I always felt that I was reading you know, Dickens is an incredible writer, obviously, but I didn't ever feel when I was reading Dickens as a child or a teenager, this is going to change the world. And the first writers I encountered who were making text that I thought could change the world were theater writers like Penny Arcade or Joseph Keckler or um, Karen Finlay. And so I tried to borrow something of that, some of that immediacy, that electricity, and a, a willingness to engage in topics that are pretty taboo. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't want to be a staid writer. And I think there are some very masterful writers who just, by dint of having written 100, 120 years ago, are now part of a canon and aren't really radical anymore. And I, I do want to still be a little radical. <laughs> radical, great. Some of my favorite parts of the book are when you describe uh, experimental performances mm -hmm. um, that the protagonist kind of engages in or watches uh, like on the streets in San Francisco, in clubs and in drag bars. Could you say a bit more about your background in performance and how that might have manifested in your writing? Absolutely, yes. So um, I started going out to parties actually in Liverpool when I was about 13 because I knew a drag queen who was a DJ. And um, <clears throat> if we would go to the bar, me and my friend, um, at like seven, while she started putting on a, sticking a gob on kind of thing, we could go into the bar and not pay and not be ID'd. So since I was in my early teens, I, I was always around theatrical people. Um, so it's absolutely been hand in hand with my entire creative process. I went to, um, I studied at first in Liverpool and then in Berkeley in Northern California. And both of those places have very vibrant, very different, but very vibrant, uh, nightlife and performance art scenes. So, I, yeah, I just kind of grew up with performers and watching performers. And my early text works were written for the stage because there are fewer boundaries between you and presenting your work on stage than there are between you and publishing a book with Bloomsbury because, you know, the world of publishing is extremely hierarchical and performance really isn't. Um, so, yeah, performance has been a a very, very significant influence on my writing. And I've known a lot of performers. And a lot of the performances referenced in this book are performances that I remember watching. And I've written to a couple of performers and said, oh, by the way, you remember that thing you used to do where you stuck an ice cream up your nose? Well, <laughs> I put that in my book. I hope you won't mind. Great. Um, so there's a beautiful passage in the book where you talk about how the process of becoming a writer uh, and realizing their sexual and gender identity run in parallel for the protagonist. Could you say a bit more about that parallel? Yes, I think that this is a real coming of age novel. And this is a character who starts off not knowing anything. All they know is that they're trying to escape some grief that they can't handle. And they spend the whole book trying to think, how can I deal with grief? They're, they're looking at Catholic theology and they're looking at quantum physics and they spend a lot of time in museums and looking <laughs> over old letters and they're just sort of looking for a, a way to handle a grief that they can't deal with um, until they start to write. And that becomes, that's like the moment when things come into clarity for them. And likewise, they have this journey with their, um, their identity. At the point of writing, they know who they are, but when they're looking back, you're kind of watching them understand how they came to know who they are. I think for a lot of people, definitely myself as well as for this protagonist, you do learn about yourself through your work. 
as you learn about your work through yourself. I mean, as an artist, you're, you are your work, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, it's impossible to separate the two. But you also learn a lot about um, what you're doing in the sort of negative space, you know? When you're, for example, there are passages, I wanted to write about certain paintings, so I'm writing about certain paintings, and then I've given myself some time off from the narrative, so to speak. So I'm talking about this painting, and the dots are connecting elsewhere in the back of my mind about what the painting is doing narratively. Um, so yeah, I think the negative space can reveal a lot about your identity and your process. For example, with this book, it's basically a love triangle, as I said. And I couldn't really understand why I would want to write a love triangle until it was just about finished and it dawned on me. When I was like 13 or 14, my mother's third husband left her for her sister. And my mother and this man had had a child together and then he left for her sister. So then my sibling was both my half brother and my step cousin for about six months. Very confusing. And this love triangle basically altered the whole, um, my whole childhood and adolescence. My family was split down the middle. Whoever's phone is that, could you please turn it off? Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so my whole family was split down the middle. Like, uh, this grandparent didn't talk to this kid. And I couldn't, as a child, I was so mortified and so horrified and so um, sort of puritanical. I was like, how could she do this? This is a disgrace. And it fundamentally changed, I believe, the course of my life. My family left Liverpool my, my mother and my siblings left Liverpool, and it totally changed everything. And I had never really thought about why she would have done that, why he would have done that. Was it, in fact, maybe better for us? So I realized towards the end of writing this book, I was investigating a love triangle because a love triangle had fundamentally changed my own life. But it was not in the forefront of my mind. That's what I was doing. Mm. So again, it's kind of the negative space. I think that's a really interesting account of your process and how writers kind of transmute from their lives, even when it's there might be some autobiographical elements, but also it's a novel, like yes. that kind of blending of the two, maybe. Yeah, Evelyn War, Evelyn War said uh, that fiction is experience entirely transformed. Mm. So what advice would you give to other writers maybe wanting to do a similar thing or write from their lives because um, in some ways it seems almost like ethically risky to talk about quite, quite difficult experiences in fiction. How, do, how should writers take care of themselves or navigate that? Okay, there's a couple of threads to that question. I think writing should be allowed to be ethically risky. I think it almost has to be ethically risky. Um, yes, and then there may be a certain blowback to that, but you also have to, you know, be a grown up about it and understand that people might have criticisms or might feel that you've overstepped the mark, but you have to overstep the mark. You know, you have to, <laughs> have to touch the hot stove, I think. And as for, this question has come up a lot actually recently, sort of self-care of when you're using your own experience and writing is very difficult. Um, I honestly didn't consider it when I started writing because I didn't know it was actually going to become this book. I just thought I might try an idea out. And it was exhausting and I do wish I would have had better strategies in place as opposed to just hunk down and try and write this, um, what turned out to be a very difficult, painful book to write. But I think that, again, has informed the tone. I think it's apparent on the page that um, this was a book that was difficult to write um, and which meant a lot to me as a writer. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of enriches it. Um, and advice to other writers, I would say you have to really love the process because if you just want the book at the end and you just want you know, to come and chat to people about how great you are, then that's a very small percentage of being a writer. It's like 2%, and the other 98% is you being like, oh my god, I'm a, such a loser, I'm such a talentless hack, like what am I gonna do? Like chain smoking and like 
pissing about with one sentence for three days. And it can be quite miserable, but if you're not engaged with it and you don't get something out of the actual process, it's the wrong game for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, th- I think that seems like really good advice. Um, just in terms of queer literature and how this fits into queer literature, do you think there's a kind of queer way of writing or a queer style? Um, I think there are probably... I'm not sure there's one queer style, but I think there are probably things that we recognize as being queer tactics or flourishes, perhaps, like a heightened language, a certain use of irony, um, a double meaning, references to certain icons and iconographies. And again, it comes into the negative space because there are lots of books that we think of as um, canonically queer now, which at the time would not have been considered so. Like, for example, Orlando by Virginia Woolf. Today it's read as being a book about like gender fluid, non-binary identities. I think in the 60s or 70s when Virginia Woolf was like reclaimed, it was read as a book about lesbian identity. And then before that it was read as like a modernist exercise. Um, so yes, to me it's a very queer book, but also the notion of queerness changes over time. Um, so yeah, there are, there are recognizable flourishes. And, and it also seeps up to the surface in writers you wouldn't necessarily think of as queer. I think there's something very queer about Ernest Hemingway, actually. When I, I was reading um, A Movable Feast over the summer, and <laughs> there's that scene where maybe, you I know? Read it. Okay. okay, it's very funny. But for some reason, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway, at the end of that book, go to the bathroom in the cafe and measure each other's dicks. And that was not the conclusion of the novel that I was expecting. And there's there's moments of like that that come through in Hemingway and also um Henry Miller as well, who I don't think we think of as like a queer writer, no? Mm. But it, it comes through, yeah. And uh, sometimes it's aesthetic decisions, and sometimes it's um <coughs> something more centered in the content. And maybe also the writers you're in conversation with, like Maggie Nelson and Ocean Bong, like today, having, yeah, yes. today, like having that lineage in the book. And also with writers who are probably less well remembered, like Ronald Fairbanks, maybe, who um, is a touch point for so many queer writers, or, or or even Bridget Brophy, who I don't think was a queer writer, but to my mind has a very sort of um, baroque camp style. And I, I don't think she was queer, but touches on them. And that's what I mean by the amorphous nature of that mm. style. Great. Could you tell us a bit more how you came to the title of the book, um, At Certain Points We Touch? That might have been the most difficult thing about this book, actually. It had so many previous titles. I wanted to call it The Bad Comedian um, to begin with, but everyone thought that was a rotten idea. And then it was going to be called In Ordinary Time, which is on the liturgical calendar. It's the, the, time, the times of year that aren't feast, feasts. Um, but then somebody beat me to the punch with that title. Um, and I went through probably 20 titles, and each one just got worse. And I would text my friends, like, what do you think about this? And they'd be like, oh, knock it off. Like, at this point, you're just going to have to call it untitled, because this is horrible. And then I read an interview, an old interview with John Ashbury in The New Yorker. And there's a character in a lot of his poems uh, that seems in some way quasi-autobiographical. So um, the interviewer had said, is this character you? And he said, no, but we touch at certain points. And I thought it was a very nice turn of phrase, not quite as nice as at certain points we touch. Um, <laughs> But I thought it worked very well because there's an ambiguity to the title. So often, so there's a theme of, as we've been talking about, autobiography or autofiction. So to have a character who um, has had some of the experiences as I have, myself and the character touch at certain points, but also the lovers touch at certain points, you know? Mm. So yeah, I, I, I stole it. I stole the title. Cheers, John. <laughs> um. And we're about to open it up for questions, so do get thinking about what you'd like to ask Lauren. Um, But before I do that, uh, what are you working on next in terms of novels? Yes, I'm writing a new book which is set in Berlin. 
and it's been a lot more fun to write, but it has been no easier because it is another fairly sprawling book. But it is about a couple of couple of cool kids who go to Berlin and sort of think we're going to be the next David Bowie, and um, it doesn't quite work out. But it's it's been a, it's been really a lot of fun to write, definitely, um, because yeah, I get to write lots of party scenes and scenes of bad behavior. Scenes of bad behavior are really great to write, actually. Lovely. Well, we look forward to reading it. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Lauren? Yes. Oh, wait for the microphone, actually. Sorry. <laughs> Microphones are coming. Um, microphone needs at the front, please. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a couple of times the immediacy of your writing and writing to and for the present. And I think that is very striking in the novel. And one of the things that also struck me was your exploration of, how can I put this, the difficulty of making a life and finding a direction and how painful, again, a word you use, that often is. Does it seem to you, I wonder, that that is peculiarly of this present, never been easy to make a life? Is it, does it seem to you harder now for young people to discover quite who they want to be, how to live as they might choose to live? Um, I don't know if I can compare it to anything else in terms of how it was in, for, for different generations. <clears throat> I think that, that you have a lot more access to um, your kind of people, maybe. You might, it might be easier for you to, I don't know, watch Dry Grace or something. Um, or, you know, get on TikTok and find some of your non-binary contemporaries. I think the crucial thing is that it seems to be getting constantly more difficult economically. It's never been easy to be a writer, especially, you know, if you are not an Amos um, or a Freud. <laughs> um, then it's really difficult. Um, the publishing is based uh, in one little slither of London, so you have to be in it to win it. Um, it's codified and guarded, so that's very difficult. And I think increasingly, yeah, just the constant pressure. My youngest sibling is 17, and I have no idea how they're going to go through university. Where on earth are they going to live? We have contemporaries um, who are doctors and nurses and have four roommates. You know, nobody can afford to buy a house. I, I think, and so I think that puts a lot of people off. I think people who aren't independently wealthy, or um, I don't know, their parents didn't buy them a house, then have to think, okay, right, I'm going to have to carve out a year of my time to write this book, and then another six months to go and talk about this book, and then maybe it will break even. And that's a huge yawning chasm to look into. And you have to be just demented enough to say, okay, I'm going to do that. Um, but I think that's always been the way, even when uh, in a movable feast, Hemingway was talking about he and his wife and their baby, they left the baby in the cart all day while she was working and he was writing, um, and they looked for like the cheapest old croissant to eat once a day. And I think it's always been difficult to be a writer, and I think only increasingly more difficult because um, you are under such a lot of pressure as well that um, when your book hits the shelves, you better be in that Observer, best 10 books of the year. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard for you to get that second book out there. Because, yeah, now it does seem like the stakes are ever higher for, for writers. Yeah. Kind of a bummer of an answer, sorry. Uh, interesting answer. Thank you. Thank you. There's another question in the front row. Writing for the stage must be really quite difficult because most conversations between people overlap. How, how, do you, how do you overcome that? And, and then 
how do you instill that into the director as to how you want it to come over, if, if you're allowed to? Um, yes, I've always worked with directors who I've had a, had a rapport with, so that's been nice, um, that we could work back and forth, and also in sort of experimental theatre, or, you know, if it's not West End theatre, you have a lot more say as, as a writer, and also because I've been in the work as well. So a lot of times you have a conversation, it's you as the writer, you as the performer and the director making something in collaboration. And this often means that you give, the, give control and trust to the director so they can say, this is not working, we don't need this. And they allow you as the performer and the writer to say, no, but I think it does. So it, it becomes a conversation. Um, and I think in terms of like writing for the stage, this book also has a certain kind of um, direct conversational tone, even though it's at times heightened, dense, somewhat convoluted language. You can read it out and it reads almost like a conversation. I did the audio book for it. And when I was reading that, I was thinking, oh great, yes, it really lands as a conversation. And I think a lot of that comes actually just from growing up in Liverpool, because um, you know, I'd go to home bargains or whatever with my mom, and she'd be like, you wait there, la, I'm gonna get the monster munch. And there'd be some old girl next to me like, oh, well, the thing is, I was coming in there for our Mary, and our Mary needed tea bags. Now, the thing about our Mary and tea bags is, and then 20 minutes later, you would have heard this woman's entire life story with endless diversions into, you know, the Blitz or whatever. So I really think I picked that up from, from my nan's friends, from my mother's friends, and I think this book reflects that because it does sort of move in multiple directions but along one loose narrative. The reason I asked, I was at a, at a performance of the Glass Menagerie in Manchester a couple of weeks ago. And there's a wonderful scene where, they do a, where there's a row between the mother and the son. But I've never seen it done as well. They both start on opposite sides of the, of the round looking away from each other and speaking continuously. So they didn't hear each other either, yes. which is, seems to me a pretty realistic view of a family row. Yes. Nobody actually hears what the other person is saying. I think the Glass Menagerie is a really interesting reference point, actually, because Tennessee Williams really had a younger sister who was lobotomized. And we don't think of Tennessee Williams as being an autobi autobiographical writer, but a lot of his stuff came out of li his lived experience. And also he spoke a lot about his characters feel so real because they were the women he grew up with. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really, it was very, very good, yes. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, any other questions? Uh, another at the front, yes. Hello. Hi. I thought what you said about the process of writing was very interesting. And it's obvious that you're very widely read. I just wondered if when you're writing, do you continue to read? Or do you go through a period of book purdah while you're writing? No, I, I do read, actually, whilst I'm writing. Um, I find it very, very difficult to relax. Um, and I don't watch television. I try, I really try to watch television. I'm like, no, be a contemporary person, watch television. And I can manage one season, one, one show a year. So no, I, I read quite constantly, actually. and I. And often there are little, the quotes that are in this book are chosen because it's what I was reading at the time of writing it. Um, and so they're little annotations for myself. I, I don't, I'm not a writer who wants to isolate myself. I don't, I don't want to think, no, I'm, there must be no other voices in my head because I think that's kind of nonsense anyway. But no, I genuinely, genuinely love reading and it's just about the only thing that relaxes me. So I very much. I'm reading continuously. And now I'm trying to read in Spanish too, which is um, also fascinating. I took a creative writing class with Garth Grenwell, who's an amazing American writer. And he said, the best thing for a writer is to learn a second language. And then you find all these biases in your own language and you understand how language works. I don't know if when you studied, if you ever were taught what is the sub Junctive in English, or why we use who or whom. I don't remember being taught any of that, but now I'm learning it by learning Spanish. Another fantastic 
diversion. <laughs> but I hope it answered the question. You're welcome. Um, other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you, that you have like a very autobiographical relationship with the protagonist. How do you navigate that? Like, how do you not put too much of yourself in the book, or put too much of yourself in the book? Um, like, how do you navigate creative pursuit with personal turmoil? Um, I don't know if I can say if I have put too much or not enough in it. Um, maybe other people think I have put too much or not enough. It was just the protagonist I wrote, I wrote them as any of the other characters, actually. I wanted them to function as a character rather than as a mirror. Last night, Anne Cleves said something really interesting. She was talking about with her characters. She says, I don't give the, too much detail. I let the reader imagine the character. I just describe the shoes. And I think that's a really great uh, metaphor for how not to over-egg the pudding. I also really like to think about um, pre-impressionist paintings, specifically Manet. A lot of his paintings, there'll be sections which are beautifully realized, like the face is immaculate, but the background is just a couple of brown squiggles. And I think that's a nice way of thinking about character too. If you talk about somebody's eyebrows, you know, we get an understanding of who the character is. But I, I, I'm not a fan of writers who say, he was five foot seven and a half, brown suit, blue hat, red tie, and a face like a tiger, green eyes, you know. And then each character gets the, so you feel like you're reading like a, a sort of police lineup or something. Yeah, there's another question at the front. Just on kind of the, I guess going back to the process of writing and, and that kind of thing, parts of um, your book that I really enjoyed and sort of stuck in my mind were kind of when pitching up in a, in a new city in San Francisco or London or New York with not much money. Um, I think for some reason there's a line that sticks in my head about how uh, your friend was buying you food and you could have half a burrito each with another friend and just like sitting there eating half a burrito. Kind of when you were kind of looking back on those memories and, and, and writing them and kind of constructing them, how, how did that kind of make you feel? Because those times obviously must have been hard, but you know, we're, we're joyous because they, they were building up and, and how did that kind of feel to, to be writing those? And obviously, you, presumably you didn't keep a diary, so you weren't reading diaries. So how, how did you kind of work in kind of getting those memories onto, onto the page? No, I don't keep diaries actually. I don't know why. I just have a sort of disinclination. <laughs> Um, so a lot of these things are fabricated as well. So they're not all drawn purely from memory. Um, also, a lot of these things come from hearing other people's conversations and then building a scene up out of that. So uh, yeah, there, there's the fabrication and the things that are remembered made me feel kind of joyous actually because there's a lot of sad stuff that happens in the book that makes you want to sort of put a lid on it and not revisit. And then when I was sort of forced to, um, it was quite marvelous. I got to look back and think, oh yeah, I guess it might have had a sorry ending, but it wasn't always sorry. So it was, um, I, I, put, I laid a lot of ghosts to rest actually. There are a couple of um, people in here that um, I've sort of merged old friends and made a character out of. And so I'd drop them a line and be like, oh, by the way, I'm working on this. How are you thinking of you kind of thing? And that was really pleasant. Yeah. So overall, it was a very, um, a very cathartic book to write. Thanks for reading. Was it half a burrito? <laughs> was it half a burrito that you had? Was, was that true? <laughs> I have eaten several half burritos, actually. A burrito is a, quite a sizable lunch, I find. <laughs> Um, any other questions? <laughs> yeah. uh, hello. Hi. So hi. Uh, so your book, uh, as you mentioned, it it uh, it's inspired by uh, from a personal loss. So how difficult? And you said you, you started it immediately. The thought of it, like to start it immediately. So how difficult it was at the initial stage to go through that grief, or like as like. Completing the book, did it help you overcome the grief? And also a follow-up follow -up question is like, how long it took you to complete the book? Thank you. Um, okay, yes. Um, it was horribly painful all the way through. And 
the writer in, in the book, the protagonist, has this realization as well. About 75% of the way through, the protagonist says, I could have chosen to stop writing now, but I haven't. And I knew that the end scene was going to be the most difficult scene to write, which is the death scene. Uh, and so I was trying to keep away from writing that. It was horribly painful, horribly, horribly painful. I was. I cried all the way through writing it, through editing it, and it was only in recording the audio book that I felt it was done, that I couldn't edit it anymore, it was complete. And at that point, I felt yeah, like I'd been exercised. Uh, yes, it was, it was a really remarkable kind of therapy to write this book, because I hadn't been able to think about my friend's death with any seriousness. I just didn't feel like I had the, the toolkit, but also the time and the space. Because, um, you know, you can have therapy, but that takes time and money, and I didn't really have those things at the time. So this became my therapy. It actually took, your second question, how long did it take to write? It took three months. I wrote it on three-month residencies. I stayed with friends who had spare rooms in all kinds of places, Costa Rica and Norway and I would just basically go someplace where someone would let me stay for free. And yeah, I wrote it in three one-month chunks. So yeah, 12 weeks, but 12 very focused weeks where I did nothing else, basically. I would leave the house for lunch, or I had a friend who lived near a graveyard. So once a day, I would walk around the graveyard. But that was it, yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Just going back to your point about characters, and I love that uh, Anne Cleves uh, thing about the shoes. Um, something that really jumped out at me from the books was the friends, the kind of cast of characters that seems so vivid. Why is friendship so important in the novel? Why is friendship so important in life? You know what I mean? I often like to think about, you know, there's Iris murder novels like The Nice and the Good where there's a cast of like nine principal characters. And I, when I read those, I'd always think, how on God's earth does she do this? So I sort of set myself a little challenge, like could I have a cast, like a, a supporting cast and a principal cast? So technically that was a lot of fun to do. Um, but also I wanted to, um, I wanted to round out the world. And I think, I hope that the reader, as you have picked up on, can say, there are all of these fun, fab friends in the background who aren't obnoxious, toxic, demanding people as the more central characters are. And in a way, the, the character being somebody who doesn't know who they are, doesn't know who they are in the world, is also kind of blind to a lot of the good stuff. You know what I mean? So I'm hoping that the reader will say, but she's so nice and she's a darling. Why don't you hang out with her instead of this one? You know, as I think that a lot of in, in real life, you will have friends who's dating somebody terrible and say like, oh, would you not get off with him? You know, look at the world around you, but they can only see that one person and that sort of tunnel vision is ultimately very destructive as it is in the book. So I'm, I'm hoping that I'm kind of privileging, giving some inf privileged information to the reader that they have that maybe the character is unaware of. Great. Um so I think we're going to wrap up the session here. But thank you so much to Lauren John Joseph for a great session and to you all for coming. Uh, I'm pleased that you could join us this morning and I hope you enjoyed. Um, I also hope we might welcome you back to our campus soon to attend our many other public events. And you can visit the University of Liverpool uh, web pages for listings to sign up for these events. So, but before we do that, can we thank Lauren John Joseph for an amazing... <laughs> And Lauren will now be signing her, her, her book downstairs, so do, do go and see and get your book signed. <laughs>